an adventure in the light of God's word. I also want to welcome the Aquaibom State community connected to this service by way of Comfort FM, XL FM Radio, Aquaibom, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. We're glad to welcome all of you to the service. We wanted to do us the favor of calling a friend, a family member, a loved one, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our social media community, help us. Let's get the message to the ends of the earth. Share the video. Join as many groups as possible. Put the videos everywhere. Let's get the light of Christ to shine in the dark places of the earth. All our campuses, we are glad to welcome all of you brothers and sisters all over the world. What a joy to have all of you in the service again today. Glory! Is there anybody excited about the word of God in this house? Can we celebrate the word with a shout? Glory to God. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and your phones. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of his grace. <clears throat> now, it's important for you to realize that it is intentional that we take a few minutes to pray every day before I teach the word, other than just teach the word. Because we're in a season of prayer, we're in a season of fasting. We're in a season of seeking and waiting and a season of paying attention to things the Spirit of God will have us say. So it's important that you, you know, you're a part of everything. Be a part of the opening prayers. Be a part of those prayers. Be a part of everything. Because like I said, all of that is part of tuning your perception to hear clearly what the Lord will have you hear. So it's important you don't take anything for granted. Everything is intentionally organized you know, in the meetings and in the services. And we might not be able to explain to you why we're doing what we're doing, but just follow the leading. As we lead you, you follow us. Do the things we ask you to do. Can I have a good amen? Please, that's very important. Also, I, I want to quickly, you know, mention that as we continue teaching, a number of things will get clear, you know, especially for those of you that are still trying to comprehend where we're going. Turn your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse number 16. We are still examining in Christ's realities, Brother Paul's revelation of identification. As also in all his epistles, and this is Brother Peter's commendation to the Pauline leaders. As, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So we began to say that, you know, a lot of people who do not pay attention to the Pauline teachings, you know, if care is not taken, they will twist the things that are taught, they will misrepresent the things that are taught, and they will even constitute a nuisance to the things that are taught. That's why Brother Peter, who was an apostle of repute, took time to say, look, what Brother Paul is teaching and what Brother Paul has written, they are some of those things that are hard to be understood. That there's a Sophia, there's a wisdom, there's an insight given to Brother Paul on the writings of the Old Testament that you need to pay attention to when you begin to read the Pauline epistles or what we call the rightly divided word of truth or what we also call the allos paracletos. And then we began to see the contact of Brother Paul and Brother Peter. And yesterday I gave you a background and I'll just proceed a bit more. And then we began to see where they had their last doctrinal contact in the book of Acts chapter 15 verse number 1. Acts chapter 15, verse number 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So there was an issue among the apostles. It says, This men came in and said, Except you be circumcised. Now look at verse 2. And there was a situation. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no sm small dissensions and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now look at verse 5, the second issue that arose in that same church. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them 
to keep the law of Moses. And we said the word arose there, there arose, the word rose there is the Greek word exanistimi, which means they grew. So it means this doctrinal opinion grew over time because they got involved in teaching it, writing books, publishing journals, holding conferences, ministers, meetings to, to get this word out there. And so they grew, this sect grew. And then we said the word sect is from the word heresies, which is used for an opinion. And oftentimes it is used for division as well as it is used for an opinion. An opinion that causes division. And you know, yesterday we saw that even Brother Paul, they accused him of being a sect leader. Now Peter began to talk about this in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. Look at how he describes you know, this issue. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Destructive heresies. Damnable heresies. Again, that word heresies mean a heresy that destroys. Damnable heresies. One thing we can rule out is the fact that Paul himself was a Pharisee. So it therefore becomes a figure of speech in this instance because he is a Pharisee that believed as well. So in Acts chapter 15, these guys rose up like we said and we said to rise means they grew. It implies that it did not happen over time. You know, it can be very subtle. The way some people push opinions. They push in their own nuances and their personal opinions into doctrinal teaching. I was just talking with mama on our way to the service this evening and I said, because I stumbled on a video a few days ago. Sometimes I have a few minutes to see what's going on around. So I stumbled on a video a few days ago where they were supposed to be doing a church conference and a church program somewhere. And the man of God spent 50 minutes telling his stories. Read only two verses. Only two verses. From the beginning to the end. This person did this to me when I declared he died. This person did this to me and I made him know that he cannot rubbish the anointed. The other day, I was in this place and uh, this situation arose and they saw the mighty hand of my God. My God that has done all this for me will do it for you. Amen. The other time, he's busy talking about his stories. Read one verse at the opening of the service. Read one more verse before he prayed for them. This sign shall follow those that believe. And people are sitting down in that audience hopelessly like victims that are chained. How, what, what will you be doing in the church where all the man is telling you is his stories? Is he the one you are to worship? Has he now substituted Christ and become your savior? And people are gathered. People are gathered. People are gathered. All he's giving them is his talk. Paul said, we preach not ourselves. But Christ, we have nothing to offer you from us that will be of any value to you spiritually. My stories will not do any good to you. You, you, you don't hear me tell you stories. I don't have stories to tell you. I'm not saying I've not gone through things. I'm not saying things are not happening in my life. Miracles, signs, and wonders. But they are of no doctrinal value to your spiritual nourishment. And people are gathered in such churches day in, day out, day in, day out. What a disservice to the body of Christ. What a disservice. Many preachers don't know that one day they will stand before Jesus and answer to all of this nonsense. Because the church is Jesus' property and he bought it with his blood. 
So you can't afford to mess around with what Jesus died to purchase. I mean, I was so sad. I was so sad. Well, like I always say, congregation deserves the kind of pastor they have. Because some of those people are still the same people that will insult us to be heretic. Well, some people come up with truth we can identify with. But when you drop your discernment level for them, then they come up with crazy stuff. So that's why in doctrinal or in Bible teaching, you don't ever drop your discernment. You discern every teaching. You are always on God, discerning every teaching. You listen carefully. You pay attention. You search the scriptures to make sure that what you are hearing is in line with pure and sound doctrine. You must always judge things by the written word. Everything you hear that is coming from pulpit or from a man of God, irrespective of who he is. So here they rose. I don't think they rose up this way. They must have started right. Then along the way, they began to say certain things. They began to bring in a mixture because it grows with time. It's like some of my sons, who are my sons in ministry, some of them are afraid to come around me now because they know that they are not pure. They know that they are playing games. And they know that somehow, somehow, it will come around. Some of them are running away. Some of them don't want to come around. Some of them, when they come around, they pretend. Because for you to stand firm and preach sound doctrine, you must die to mammon. And most of them, their problem is mammon. One of my sons said to me, well, Papa, when we are preaching the liberty that is in Christ, and I discover that they are getting too free, I use a little law to tie them. I use a little law to tie them. Can you hear that? Can you imagine that? <laughs> we were in London somewhere to preach, and uh, the bishop of the church didn't know when he started telling us. He said, you know, these my members are very stupid people. Very, very stupid people. That's a bishop talking about his members, people that Christ died for. He said, they're very stupid people. He said, if you ask them for money, they will not bring. So I bring all these prophets to come and wow them and empty their pocket. What? That was my last time in that church. That was my last time in that church. That was my last time in that church. Because that man is not in ministry for souls. He's in ministry for his stomach. Whose God is their belly. And when a man is in ministry for his stomach, he doesn't care about rightly divided word. And that's why I told you, when scriptures are not rightly divided, what is being communicated? Can I hear you louder? The radio people are waiting to hear you. What is being communicated? You cannot find truth out of a lie. The truth of the gospel can only be communicated when scriptures are rightly divided. Am I communicating at all? Alright, so brother Peter began to warn. And he says these guys will grow with time. They arose with time. And that's why discernment is very critical. And you know discernment has nothing to do with rudeness or loud mouth. That's not discernment. Discernment is the ability to be able to know that no, this does not agree with sound Bible teaching. This is out of order or this is not right. That's what discernment is. And when it comes to this kind of things, they are never approached with caution. When people begin to openly abuse the sensibility of scripture, we don't approach those issues with caution. We are radical about issues, not about persons. We deal with the issues head on and we don't allow those things get away. We bring light to darkness and we shine the light on the darkness so that others who are looking for light will know the difference between darkness and light. Look at that Acts chapter 15 verse 5 again. Acts chapter 15 verse number 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them 
and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Take note of the word circumcise. To circumcise them and then to keep the law of Moses. Which is the word terio in the Greek. Used basically to watch something and observe. Terio, to watch something and observe. Now, so they were instructed that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. To command them to keep the law of Moses. Another word I want to do a little work on is the word saying. The word saying. But there arose of certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying. That word saying is the word paragelo in the Greek. Paragelo. P -A -R -A -A, I mean G-E-L-L-O. It means to direct and warn. Saying. Paragelo. To direct and warn. In other words, they gave a direction and a warning. They gave a direction and a warning. Sometimes it's very strong. Like someone came up and said, listen carefully, Titan is the barest minimum we should start from. As believers, it's obligatory to show your love for God. You didn't hear what I said. So let me say it again. Now listen carefully. Titan is the barest minimum we should start from. As believers, it's obligatory to show your love for God. Someone else said, Titan is God's law of increase. If you want God to bless you and you want him to increase the works of your hands, you must tithe. Well, the other day I also saw somebody posted this somewhere. Another man of God in Nigeria said, if you give to the poor, you will soon be like the poor. My goodness. Damnable heresy. If you give to the poor, you will soon be like the poor. Wonderful. Wonderful. Bill Gates has been given to the poor forever and he has not become poor. Other philanthropies around the world, they are given to the poor and they have not become poor. So now the, the question is, what's the difference between the two? He said, this one is New Testament. So I said to him, none of them is New Testament. Then I said to him, however, one is destructive and the other is not. Because we're dealing with heresies, now we're looking at damnable heresies. Destructive heresies. The other one that says, if you want God to bless you, is a paragelo. Because it's a warning. And in that warning, is a direction to give. Paragelo. If you want God to bless you, that's a warning. You must give. That's a direction. That's a paragelo. Stay with me. The other one is harmless at his first instance. But with continuous meditation, it brings out its poison. The one that says, Titan is God's law of increase. If you want God to bless you and you want God to increase the work of your hands, you must tithe. It looks harmless, but if you meditate on it a bit, you will see the poison in that statement. Just like the other one too has a very serious poison in it. If you give to the poor, you will end up being like the poor. That's poisonous. Another poison is, if you don't tight, things will be tight. It looks innocent, but it has poison. Your offering will end your suffering. 
It sounds very nice, but it has poison in it. So you must know how things are passed across and the subtlety in them and the authority it brings along. So in this instance, the first two statements, they look different. They come from the same source, but one is stronger than the other. So here it says, they were directing the church, Paragelo, warning to keep the law of Moses. Watch, that is the word, the law, Terio or keep. Terio nomos mosios. Terio nomos. Nomos means law. Terio nomos mosios. It means what Moses is saying. Keep to it. Make sure what Moses is saying does not fall to the ground. Watch what Moses is saying. Keep to it. And of course, that's where the word circumcise comes in. That word circumcise. Circumcise there becomes a shorthand or a summary of the procedure of the law. A summary. The word circumcise. That's like saying keep the law in a summarized statement. Look at verse 6 of that Acts chapter 15. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. The word to consider means to look through it. Then the word matter, the word matter there means logos. L-O-G-O-S, logos. Logos will be the thought, the subject matter, the opinion. And the word to consider is the word horao. Horao, to consider. So, consider, to look through it, horao, the matter, logos. Horao means to look at it. Now, let's observe it a bit closely. Verse 7 of that same chapter 15 of Acts. Verse 7. And when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, You know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. I like brother Peter. Now brother Peter is rolling out his CV of ministry. You know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles whom you are trying to segregate right now by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Next verse. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. I love brother Peter. You know what Peter did to them? Because some of them that were in that eldership that were considering giving the Gentiles, you know, um, uh, conditions, God saved by Peter's ministry on the day of Pentecost. So I'm sure Peter said, uh -uh, even you, even you, you joined to say what you are saying. Were you not part of those that got born again through my preaching on the day of Pentecost? You know that God chose some of us. That by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the gospel. He was putting everybody in their place. And bringing up an apologia for salvation. Stay with me. Now, there's a word there, much disputing in verse 7. Much disputing. is the Greek word, zetesis. Z-E-T-E-S-I-S. -E -E Zetesis. It's used for investigating. There's something a bit tricky about this word. Every time this word comes up again, it comes up like what is negative. You know, it comes up like what is negative. For example, in First Timothy chapter 1 verse 4, 
Brother Paul warns Timothy about it. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 4. Neither give it to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Don't give heed to fables. Then look at the same thing in 1 Timothy 6 verse 4. It is always used negatively. He is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words. Whereof commit envy, strife, railings and evil surmisings. Now he also used that word negatively. You can write this down for further study at home. 2 Timothy 2.23 and Titus chapter 3 verse 9. So when you look at the use of that word, you are made to feel what was done here. Was it negative? Maybe we should qualify how Paul used it. I think in the pastoral letters, in the pastoral letters, it's unnecessary. But here, since it was part of it, it has, it has become necessary here, that there was a dispute they were investigating, of course, investigating will be, they were searching the scriptures. Like, what was written? What was said? Statements made. And this went on for weeks. This went on for, because this dispute here was strong. Because it was a determinant for salvation. So, it went on for weeks. Then Peter got up like he should. And in Acts 15, 7, Peter now rose up and spoke. Of course, I want you to know that Peter grew over time too. Okay? Peter had grown spiritually. Peter got up. He made valid points in the things he said. Let's look at some of the valid points that Peter made in the things he said. The first thing he brings out here is there is no distinction between us and them. That's exactly what Peter does. Because look at it again. That Acts 15 verse 7 and 8. I will add 9 now. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Verse 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Next verse. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. So the first thing Peter establishes is there is no distinction. Alright? Because it was Peter who must have ministered to those people like I told you who were in the leadership. He said to them, you got saved by my mouth. You got saved by my mouth. It's interesting how he brought that to bear in his defense. Like I am the one that spoke to them. Like I spoke to you. Are you following? Okay. Second emphasis. Which is stronger? Faith. Purified their hearts by faith. A strong word in the epistles is the word pistis. Faith, pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. -I he says, he purified their hearts by faith. Catharizo. Catharizo, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-Z-O. Catharizo, used 31 times. Many times, it is used for cleansing lepers. Figuratively, is to speak of the cleansing of our hearts from sin. And you will find that word for further studies in Matthew 23, 25 to 26. And then Peter said the purification of their heart was by faith. Of course, he explains this in details because you know that this is a summary of all that happened over weeks. Now, we look at Acts chapter 10 verse 15. That's exactly what the angel said to him. 
In Acts 10, 15. What, and the voice spoke unto him again the second time. What God had cleansed. That call not thou common. So Peter brought that statement the angel made about the Gentiles into his defense. That God has purified, cleansed their hearts by faith. Because in the vision, when he was asked to stand up and kill the animals, and he said it's unclean, God told him, I have cleaned them. Don't call them unclean. So he brought that vision and the doctrinal value in the vision, which is purification by faith, into his defense. Are we together here? Please pay attention. Now, he repeats it again in Acts 15 verse 9. Acts 15 verse 9. Put it up for me. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. In other words, what he's saying here is faith in the heart is what cleanses a man. Faith in the heart is what makes a man pure. Faith in the heart is what purifies a man. So the first thing he talks about is there is no distinction. Number two, faith in the heart is what cleanses. The word katarizo used in the epistle to cleanse. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, brother Paul used it. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us catarizo ourselves. And of course, Ephesians 5, 26, that he might cleanse it by the washing of water by the world. Again, he's talking about the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus. You can read further, Titus chapter 2 verse 14 and Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 and Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. All cleansing in the Bible are redemptive in nature. All cleansing in the Bible are redemptive in nature. So the first thing it deals with is there is no distinction. The second thing it deals with is faith. The third thing Peter deals with is now legalism. Legalism. Look at that Acts 15 verse 10. Acts chapter 15 verse 10. Now therefore why tempt he God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Yoke is the word Zygon in the Greek. The word yoke is the word Zygon, Z-Y-G-O-N. Zygon, which is actually a learning. Yoke is not English. I've told you that Bible has its own language. The word yoke there is the word Zygon. It means a learning, a form of education. That is why you are asking them to learn the scriptures this way. Pete, I mean, the, 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 the sect, we are compelling the Gentiles to learn the scriptures by viewing the scriptures through the lenses of the law of Moses. They were instructing them that the only way to understand the scriptures and read it well will be through the lenses of Moses, which brings in circumcision and other requirements of the law to be, san to be, to be sanctified. That is, there is a learning of the same scriptures that Peter calls a zygon that they cannot bear. A zygon. So look at the key way that an apologia, which means a defense, is made. Those of you that are in pastoral institute by now, some things are falling in place. This is how an apologia or a defense is made. The first thing he does is that he explains the scriptures. That's the first thing he does. Then his authority comes into play. You know that the same way my mouth got you saved, is the same way my mouth got them saved. Authority. After putting the scripture, he brings authority. You know why? 
That's why sometimes you have to look at your experience and exposure before you make certain statements publicly. There are things I say you are not yet ready to say them. You must know the one you can say. And you must know the one that you need another 15 years to say. Because there's a place where authority and exposure in ministry comes into play. That's why I say some things here and nobody's debunking it. Because you know the person speaking has been around. That's why sometimes I pull out my CV. I've been in ministry now almost four decades. Forty years. So I can say some things. That's why sometimes I will tell you, when they say Dr. Damina is talking against the fathers, who are the fathers? Who are, am I a boy? Huh? I'm a father of many of the people they call fathers. I shall actually be a grandfather. What are you talking about? Some of the practices they are wallowing in, we, we've introduced it. <laughs> it, honey, I, I don't know if I've told you this before. It will shock you to know that Koboko service started in this church. Koboko service, it was in Power City, Power Chapel. It started in Power Chapel. Not Power City, Power Chapel. Mama and I were out of the country. So I invited a friend of mine. Pastor, that you remember? Pastor, that you remember very well. I, I invited a friend of mine to come and preach in this church. After the service, they, they called us and said the service was hot. I said, what happened in the service? He said, Papa, uh, we're waiting for tomorrow. We can't wait for tomorrow. I said, what happened? He said, the man of God, I don't want to call his name. He said, the man of God in, asked us to come with Koboko. At that time, there has been no Koboko service anywhere. The man of God asked us to come with Koboko. For what? He said, he said we should flog Satan. <laughs> that day, they flog and flog. The whole church was, Koboko was everywhere. Sticks everywhere. People flog. It was in this church. It started then small time. We started hearing Koboko services everywhere. We, we started it here. I was one of the first persons who introduced anointing oil in Assemblies of God, Nigeria. Assemblies of God, Nigeria. The first day I brought the bottle into Assemblies of God to anoint people, they locked me inside the church that I will not go out till I tell them what is inside that bottle. And one of the elders was in this church some months ago. He sat here. Dr. Gabe, you brought him. He was one of the elders. He reminded me that day in my office. He said, do you remember the first time you brought olive oil into our church? And he's one of the ambassadors of Assemblies of God, Nigeria. He said, do you remember that the first time you brought the oil into Assemblies of God and you anointed people, you were locked in the church. We were asking you to explain what is in the oil because it was, nobody does that. Now it's all over Assemblies of God. He said, I'm talking, who are the fathers? We're not just fathers, we're inventors. Even though we invented nonsense. <laughs> no, I'm not saying Baba. Say Baba is there. <laughs> because it takes authority to be able to correct things publicly. It's not just knowledge. There's an authority that ought to accompany the knowledge. The CV that should be behind the person bringing the correction. It takes authority. That's why Peter put his CV now. He said, all of you here that are talking, is by my mouth you all got saved. 
The same mouth that got you saved, got these people saved. What's the problem? Authority. Am I communicating? There are some of my friends that are doctrinally sound. When they want some things communicated to the body of Christ, they say, Dr. Damina, this, 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 this. I can't say it, but you have the authority to say it. Please, can, can you correct this? They are sound doctrinal people. But when it comes to certain things to be said into the body, they call me. And after praying about it, I put it out. Say, I hear you. Very important. Very important. So first thing he does is to explain scriptures well. Then he identifies what the issues are. Then he explains them. Then he now attacks the issues headlong. Which is proper. Very proper. Because in verse 10 he now really does, you know, he now deals with the issue. Look at verse 10. Now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke, because that's the real issue, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. That is, you are causing them to learn what they are not supposed to learn this way. And he calls it with the right words, a yoke. That is a learning, a burden to bear, which no Jew could bear, which is hypocrisy. What we the Jews cannot bear, which we are struggling with, you now transfer it to the Gentiles who don't even understand what we're talking about. Hypocrisy means it's not true. Hypocrisy is a life of a lie. Hypocrisy. Living a life of a lie. That's hypocrisy which neither we nor our fathers could bear. And that ended the debate. That was the end of that debate. Now this helps you with how to communicate doctrinal issues. It's not like Peter just got up and said things. No, if you read verse 8, 9, and 10 where we read, you could think it was a brief speech. But this was a debate going on for weeks. So this is a summary of the outcome of that debate. Which means there was a summary of what was said. That's why it is called a logos. Matter. This matter. This logos. This is the explanation of the several scriptures that he quoted. Because in defending doctrinal issue, you must get contextual and interpret scriptures properly. This is an explanation of a summary of all that Peter said to these people. And this is important in our study. You can call it a shorter form or a charisma. What is said? What is said? So that is where the issue is. I'm saying this because this will come in hand in the course of this teaching. What he explained over a period of time was summarized in a few minutes. And he used a lot of scriptures to bring out his defense. So we can therefore say the letters and epistles are also like that. Some of them, you see them summarized. Short form. Explanation. And the letters could carry this kind of format as well. The letters were reading from the doctrinal materials were examining Go carry that format as well. Can I have a powerful amen? I said, can I have a powerful amen? amen? Now, there were two Greek words I gave you yesterday. I don't know if you remember. The word skotos and the word skotia. Do you remember those two words? Skotos and skotia. All right? And then we stopped at dealing with Moses' verbiage. We saw that Moses began to talk things like light and John, in the beginning, said, light is life. The light is the life of men. Then we did some exegesis on light and darkness. Light and darkness. We did some exegesis on that. 
Acts chapter 26 verse 18, we saw Brother Paul's message. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. So we said light and darkness are spiritual principles. Light and darkness is not like the absence of sun and moon. They are spiritual principles. Then we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so Paul gives a clear hermeneutics, hermeneutics about what Moses wrote. Now we're going to investigate some of it. Shine in our hearts. He is talking about the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14, look at the way he says it. 2 Corinthians 6 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Light with darkness. So light and darkness has to do with man. Light in man, darkness in man. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 to 11 for further studies where he talks about man. Ephesians 5, 8 to 11. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. He talks about rulers of the darkness of this world which are in men. Rulers of the darkness of this world which are in men. Colossians 1, 13. Delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So darkness has to do with man. Delivered us from darkness into his light. Light has to do with man. Darkness, man, light, man, spiritual principles. So all of these are writings of Moses. Because it was Moses who in the beginning wrote light and darkness. When there was no sun, moon, and stars, there was no heavens and earth. When Moses says darkness, and God said light be. So darkness and light, therefore, are spiritual realities. Darkness and light are spiritual realities. Are you still here? Very good. <clears throat> Jesus used the same verbiage. Jesus, Peter, John, Paul, they all used the same verbiage and all the apostles. Consistency of theology. So in John chapter 5, when Jesus said that if you had believed Moses, you will have believed me, that is what he was talking about. Look at it, John 5, 46 and 47. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Next verse. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Moses wrote of me. This is what Jesus was saying. So when he now said in verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. This is what he was referring to. So that means Moses therefore tied his writings by testifying of Jesus. Moses tied his writings by testifying of Jesus. Because John calls him God's personal message. In the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning was God's personal message. Let's explore Moses a bit. Moses had to write that way. Because when Moses was writing, Moses was writing after the fact. You understand? The way Moses wrote, he wrote after the fact. He didn't write before the fact. 
So Moses used Genesis 1 as the mixture as it were. Allow me use the word mixture. He used that word and that phrase of both salvation as literal and figurative. Literal because it was an after fact writing. So there will be literal and figurative. Then he explains God's plan of salvation in the midst of creation. In the midst of creation, he explains God's plan of salvation because he's using literal and figurative. Please stay with me. And so it takes a proper student of scripture to know what Moses was passing across. It takes a proper student. Don't forget, he is not talking to a physical church. He is talking to those who should be convinced about Jesus. And that's why he wrote the way he did. So in John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, John 14, 16, 17, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, Numa Aletia, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you now, and after resurrection shall be in you. Numa Aletia. He uses that phrase long enough for you not to forget. Because in that John chapter 14 verse 6, he says he is the truth. In John 14, 26, he talks about another comforter. In John 15, 26, he talks about the spirit of truth. In John 16, 13, he talks about the spirit of truth. Why such emphasis? Once again, remember, John 14, 6, he calls himself the truth. John 14, 26, he talks about another comforter. John 15, 26, he talks about the spirit of truth. In John 16, 13, he talks about the spirit of truth. Why the emphasis? Because the word truth is the word aletia. A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. -E -E aletia from the word aletis. Aletis. A-L-E-T-H-E-S. Aletis. Aletis means unconcealed. Uncovered. It has to do with something that has been opened for people to see. Unconcealed. Aletis. Aletia. The spirit of Aletia. Taken from Aletis. And don't forget the truth that is open for people to see is the Old, Old Testament writings. The truth that has been opened for people to see is the Old Testament writings. So in John 16, 12, uh, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. That is, when he, the spirit of full disclosure, aletia, aletis, uncovered, the spirit of full disclosure, he will guide you into all of the truth. He will guide you into all of the truth about me, who is God's word. Into all of the truth about me, Jesus is speaking, who is God's word. All of the truth. Remember again, we said... That word guide is for the blind. When you lead a blind man to light. Notice an element in Jesus' teaching. Words about the spirit of truth. And the guidance that he mentions. He will guide you. It's an identification word. That is, 
the spirit of truth will be identified with the church. He will be identified with the church. And when brother Paul now will write it, he uses the word in Christ. In Christ. The spirit of truth will be identified with the church. In Christos. That is what he meant. The spirit of that reality. So Jesus therefore taught from Genesis. So when he says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, these are the things he meant. The spirit of truth, which is Numa, Numa Aletia, is therefore clear that Paul's Numa is the same with Jesus' Numa. Okay? Consistency. The spirit he says. Look at John 16, 7 to 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is judged. You and I know that this convincing the world of truth will be via preaching. Convincing the world of truth will be via preaching by the same people he was talking to. He will convince about Jesus. It's not the spirit that will hear. The people he was talking to will hear. The spirit doesn't hear. It's the spirit that is talking. And the people he is talking to are the ones that will hear. Whatever you shall hear, shall you speak. For he, the spirit, will show you things to come. I don't know if you got that. Whatever you shall hear, you shall speak. For the spirit will guide you into all of the truth. Look at it. It's in verse 13. That's where I'm, that's where I'm making this interpretation. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you that I'm talking to into all the truth. For, he, for you shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever you shall hear, that shall you speak. Then he will show you things to come. Is it clear? It's not the spirit that we hear. Who is he hearing from now? The spirit is the one talking. So the people that will hear are the people he's talking to. Are we in the building? The spirit is not hearing from anybody. The spirit is God himself. Watch now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all of the truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever you that I'm talking to shall hear, that shall you speak. Then the Spirit will show you things to come. Settled? Is it settled? It's a syntax problem by interpretation. Now, so you hear, you speak. For he shall show you things to come. So the speaking refers to them. They are the ones that will convince who are they convincing? The world. How are they convincing the world? Preaching. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. They are the ones convincing the world. So the spirit of truth, therefore, will be as it were, let me use this word, because of lack of more words to use. The spirit of truth is the agent or the agency of our convincing the world. He's the agent. 
or the agency. So when we are speaking, the spirit of God through us will convince the world. That is the pneuma in Christ's writings. The pneuma, the breath, the spirit. So now look at Paul as a roundup. Are you blessed? 1 Corinthians 2, 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching. Ah, hey, look at me everybody. Did you see what Jesus said about the spirit? Hello, church. Did you see what Jesus said about the spirit? When he is come, what will he do? He will guide who? You that he was talking to, into all of the truth. Okay? He will speak to you. And what you shall hear, that you shall speak. So who will empower you to do the speaking? The spirit. The pneuma aletia. Or allos paracletos. Or the spirit of truth. Clear? Now, look at the way Paul will take Jesus' verbiage here and expand it. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Of the spirit. Now Jesus already says here, he will guide you into all the truth. You shall speak what you shall hear and he will show you things to come. So in Paul's words, Paul is saying the same thing Jesus said but with more verbiage. In demonstration of spirit and of power. The word demonstration of spirit is the Greek word apodexis. Apodexis. A-P-O-D-E-X-I-S. X-I-S. Apodexis. It means to flash forth light on a surface so that it can be seen. Demonstration of spirit and of power to flash forth light on a surface so that it can be seen. Apodexis. And that's exactly what Jesus means by the spirit of truth. You know? The spirit of full disclosure. Apodexis. To flash forth light. So people can see. Full disclosure. Numa aletia. So the same thing Jesus is saying is the same thing Paul is saying. Demonstration of the spirit and of power. Apodexis. Now. Mm -mm -mm. Are you here? First Corinthians 2 9. And I round off there so that we can pray. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Hold on. The spirit of truth will be seen where? What will the spirit of truth guide you into? Where is all of the truth? City. Eh? Eh? I will keep you here till 10 o'clock. <laughs> when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. Where? Eh? No, no, no. Don't confuse yourselves. In the epistles. Was the epistles written at that time? He will guide you into all the truth. Where is all the truth? The scriptures. That's why the epistles are the revelation of the truth of the scriptures. That's why the epistles is the spirit of truth. The revelation of the scriptures. The full disclosure. Apocalypse. 
which was brought about by Numa Aletia or Apodexis. Apodexis. In the Old Testament, the Spirit has nothing concealed about God or Christ. And Paul calls it apodexis. Now, somebody will quickly ask me if you're theologically thinking, why didn't Paul maintain aletia? Why did he change the verbiage from aletia to apodexis? Remember what Peter said, our brother Paul, according to the insight, the Sophia. So, apodexis is one of those Paul's Sophias. He wouldn't use aletia. Aletia does not bring the full import. Remember Jesus said, I have many things to say, but you cannot bear it. So it means the verbiage I'm using to communicate doesn't carry everything I want to say. So when Paul comes in, he takes that verbiage and looks for a superior verbiage that brings out the full import and applies apodexis, demonstration of spirit, to flash forth light on the surface for people to see. So Jesus' aletia is Paul's apodexis. Did you understand? Look at verse 10. Yeah, but God, but God, eyes have not seen. He used Isaiah's words. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Neither has not come to the heart of man. What God has prepared for them that love him. But God. Everybody read together with me. But God. Can we go one to go? But God hath revealed them unto us. How? This spirit. Is it Jesus' spirit? Eh? This spirit. Is it Jesus' spirit? Numa. Numa Aletia. And this one is what? Apodexis. So what Numa Aletia was to Jesus is what Apodexis was to Paul. Getting clear? So there's consistency of theology. Don't forget, Numa Aletia didn't begin with Jesus. Jesus taught from Moses' outline. So Numa Aletia began where? Darkness upon the face of the deep and what? The spirit of God upon the face of the waters. The Ruach of God. The Ruach which became the Numa Aletia which now is the Apodexis. Did you see verbiage? You see graduation of explanation? The Ruach became the Numa Aletia, which Brother Paul now brings in the spirit of truth as what? The Apodexis. Stand up, let's close. Glory to God. Are you enjoying this? Glory! Amen. Somebody say revelation. Somebody say identification. Say the same spirit. From Genesis, through creation, through the Gospels, manifested in the epistles, lives on my inside. I didn't hear a powerful amen. amen. Lift your two hands to heaven and begin to thank God for his word. Thank God for light. Thank God for equipping. Thank God for building. Thank God for growth. Thank God for maturity that is happening in this house. Open your mouth and begin to give thanks. I want to hear your voices. Le grada da la da baba prada ba e kaba da zo se vele bo do sa prada ska pa da ba bo ro po to sa ba ingra do se prediza ko do bo so po de be de kai ila ba ne men do so prada ga di ga ba da lo bo so repeke zo sa pa la da vele da zo ba da ba ba do ri pa zo sa pa le ge do sa pa la tai re be be do sa pa ta sa pa la ga de 